We didn't want to make everybody come and stand down in front for a photo, so we're just going to put Shanjin sort of in the middle. I can hear you now. I'm, I'm good here. She's the Varetta. everybody for coming this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Shanjin's talk. Um, Shanjin is here from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada, um, where she works as an archivist slash records analyst because her training is in archives and records management. Um, she did her some work at UBC and then her master's degree in information science um, at Dalhousie University. and. Um, she is, has the Master's in Library and Information Science. She is a certified records manager. This is through ARMA International. And then through AIM, she is a certified information professional. So um, she has quite the laundry list of professional qualifications. And she's um, here because she's working on an article um, uh, on university archives uh, in Canada, kind of a comparative situation, because everybody has a different story to tell about how their archives was founded, how it evolved, where it fits into the structure, what its roles and responsibilities are um, within a university. And right now, she's here in Hong Kong um, talking to archivists here to learn about university archives in Hong Kong, because then that may become a part of this uh, comparative article. So I hope um, that you'll have some questions for her uh, after she gives her talk. So may I introduce Hi. Shan Jin and to get into it. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, I probably will sit here so it's closer to the speaker and I can also, you know, um, to do this. So um, first um, I will thank um, the HKU libraries and the archives to give me these opportunities uh, to give a talk about um, Queen's University archives. So here uh, is um, today's main topic. Um, so I will talk a little bit about um, the highlights of our um, holdings and the history of the Queen's University archives and the services we provide to both the campus community and the general public. And I will also leave about um, um, one fourth of my time to talk about the records management program. And uh, so our records retention schedules and the archival transfer procedures and the records storage and the records destruction. And I will also talk about the impact of the access and the privacy legislation specific um, um, university um, archives. And just finally, so a little bit about archival education and the professional development um, in Canada. So um, first, um, so I want to introduce uh, you about uh, our little town called Kingston. So I do open uh, um, Google Photos, so give you some idea. So Kingston is uh, located in the province of um, uh, Ontario. So here is Kingston. So it's kind of a midway between Toronto and Montreal. And uh, here is Ottawa. So that's the capital city of um, uh, Canada. So that's where we are located. So give you some idea. So Kingston is one of the oldest um, communities in Canada. Uh, so it actually predates the establishment of the ca Canadian nation itself. And uh, so there's some interesting fact about uh, the city of Kingston. 
So uh, it was actually chosen as the first capital of Canada, but it only served this role for four years, um, between 1841 and 1844. So 1841, I think, is also the time um, the British troops landed in Hong Kong. So let's give you some perspective is how old is um, the city of Kingston. So, uh, so this is a picture of uh, Queen's University. So we uh, were established in 1841. So last year we just celebrated the 175th birthday um, of the university. So the university, um, we are not big, so we have an enrollment uh, about 22,000 students. And we have faculties of more than 3,000 from one of the best um, universities from the world. And so the university consists of um, eight faculties and schools, and we have seven libraries, including the archives. Um, so, so Queen's University, we have a long archival tradition. So in 1869, so Professor George Ferguson made the first donation uh, to the university archives. And the first full-time archivist um, was hired in 1960. So uh, at that time, the archivist report to the university library. Uh, but in 1981, the university archives uh, became a separate administrative unit. And we moved to our own building. Um, but 30 years later, the university archives was uh, brought back to um, the Queen's University Library. So it's like a full circle. So here are some of our um, uh, the mandate. So as a uh, university archives, so we preserve the university's archival resources of national, provincial, and regional significance. So we serve as the university's corporate memory. Um, we also need to support teaching, research, and outreach program at the university. And um, so we also help uh, the external organizations uh, provide archival management and conservation for sig uh, culturally significant records. Uh, and we see ourselves as a source of heritage information uh, in the general community. So I, I think I, I kind of switched the slides a little bit. Um, so here's our own building. So it looks like it only has three floors, but actually it has four floors and um, a basement. So five floors. So that's belong to the archives. So this um, is building was actually built in 1907. So it's more than 100 years old. Uh, it was called the New Medical Building because at that time, the Department of Medicine, they grow really fast, so they need a new building. And so this building continued to be used for medical purpose for many years. And there's some interesting fact about this building, because during the Second World War, so the Queen's faculty, uh, which worked for uh, the government, they did some research in this building on biological weapons, so that was uh, secret to kept it for many years because we have some photos you can see there's a guard in front of this building because they are doing this secret research uh, but um, when uh, it's um, it was in 1981 so uh, queen's graduate and uh, the university counselor kathleen roy so at that time she donated funds required uh, for renovating this building and turn it into the permanent home for the university archives. And we have been there ever since. So currently, we have st uh, eight staff members. So the head is the university archivist. archivist. So we have three other archivists uh, responsible for different areas of the archives. So my title is the records analyst. Uh, but we, I also serve some reference desk duties. And we have a half-time conservator and the two archives technicians. 
Uh, so here's our reading room, um, because on most of our holdings um, are held in this building, so we were able to provide um, people access to our records um, so in the, almost immediately. So um, anyone, they don't have to make appointments, they can just come in during our hours operation, so which is Monday through Friday uh, from 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. And uh, we do have a locker, so we people are required to put their bags in the locker. But um, so in the reading room, they only allow using pencil and um, we allow them to use digital cameras to take picture of our archival material free of charge. But if they want to a better scanning of photos, so they have to pay a fee for that. But that's uh, about 15 Canadian dollars for a high resolution of a digitized photo. Uh, so this is our vault, and uh, so some of our holdings, so we collect university records, private records, uh, we have uh, millions of photographs, and we have some architecture drawings, plans, and um, audio and visual uh, collections, and um, university publications, and uh, thesis. So, the records, um, so the university records, um, which um, is about half uh, of our holdings. So the majority of those records uh, are transferred to the archives uh, from the different administrative and faculty office uh, <coughs> through the records management program and others uh, are donated uh, by from a variety of sources uh, including faculty, staff, students, alumni and some other uh, organizations. So this one is actually one of our most precious uh, documents held uh, in the university archives. So this is the original royal charter issued by Queen Victoria. So that's why so the university is called Queen's University, because we have this royal charter. So uh, actually, this charter was not really signed by Queen Victoria herself. But this document attached uh, the official seal uh, um, of Queen Victoria. And um, so in 1991, so the university was celebrating its 150th uh, uh, birthday. So in that year, so the university invited um, the Prince Charles and um, uh, Princess Diana to the university. So at that time, so the archivists uh, were given a task. So they have to make a replica of this royal charter and the seal. So it took them some time because at that time the original was already in bad shape. But we uh, fortunately we have a conservator. So so that's uh, that's the woman in the photos, and uh, the man is uh, currently our university archivist. So they, they succeed and make the replica for the Prince Charles to unveil during the ceremony. And um, so currently the replica was permanently on display in our university center. And the original remains in the archives and so we put it in this red box. So anyone can come in to ask to see this original document by appointment. So, some of our um, university records, um, you know, administration and the government's records. So we do have, um, like the board of the trustee records, academic uh, calendars, the minutes of the senate, back to the beginning of the university. And uh, these are some of other university records. And we also hold a substantial collection of Queen's University's publication. So most notably is this Queen's Journal. So this is Canada's the oldest student newspaper. And so recently we make an effort to digitize the first 101 volumes of the Queen's Journal. So they are available online so anyone can use them. And we have Queen's 
uh, quarterly, which is an academic journal, and the tricolor is um, the Queen's University's yearbook. Uh, it was called tricolor because uh, so Queen's so the red, the gold, and blue is this is the three color of Queen's University. And because we have this, um, you know, thousands of documents, these rich collections um, held in Queen's archives, so the university's um, historian, so he spent years in the archives, and recently, last year in 2016, so he was a he was able to finish the third volume um, of um, Queen's University's official history. So now we have a total of three volumes of um, Queen's University's history. And so now I want to take the other half of our holdings. So that's the private manuscript. And um, so the private records, we acquire them mainly uh, through donations. So donation um, of archival material in Canada may be eligible for a tax, uh, tax credit. And the university also set up uh, a Friends of Archives Trust Fund. So monetary contributions um, are eligible for tax credit as well. So this, um, I think, is one of the incentives to encourage people to donate archival material uh, to the archives. So our private manuscript and reflect a um, variety of thematic areas. So from some of the famous authors to scientists and to political parties and from local business to genealogy resources. So that's our private uh, records. So just uh, last year, so we are able to acquire Dr. Arthur B. McDonald's records. So um, he is the fourth Canadian and the first Queen's faculty members uh, to achieve the Nobel Prize in Physics. So we were able to get um, the records in his office uh, from 1984 to 2015. So we were quite happy about that. And uh, so I think everyone know. So this is um, the Canada's national flag. So so Queen's University, uh, we are very proud. So we have um, the first prototype um, of um, the Canada's flag. So this is a part of this John Matheson form. So form is a French term. So uh, the universe. Um, the Canadian archivist we like to use. So it's not exactly the same as collection, but uh, uh, I think if you, um, but we use this form, uh, this term. <coughs> so why we have this original cheesecloth Canadian flag prototype is because this John Ross Matheson. So what happened is that uh, so during 1960s, so um, so many people might know, so um, uh, there's uh, French-speaking Canadians and English-speaking Canadians. So during the 1960s, so the Quebec separatist movement, they caused quite uh, some national tension in Canada because they want to become independent. And so it was clear, so Canada at that time, we really needed a symbol to unite the nation. So at that time, the Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, so he established a committee in 1964 to oversee the creation and the design of Canada's new flag. So John Matheson, so he um, was a Canadian politician and a Kingston resident. So he played an important role in the flag's recreation um, because he was um, the leading member of the Pearson Flag Committee. So here's a photo of the committee, and here are the, all the different designs, suggestions of Canadian flag. So after you see all of those, you know, suggestions, I think for me, myself, I really, you know, really appreciate the simple design of the red maple leaf flag of Canada. 
And uh, so that's um, the John Ross Matheson form. So here's another highlight of our collection. So this is the Vimy Memorial. Um, so this memorial is designed by one of uh, Canada's uh, most uh, famous uh, architect and a sculpture, a sculpture. So his name is this Walter Seymour Award. So this memorial um, is one of his most prominent uh, work. And uh, so uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge um, was fought um, in 1917, so that's during the First World War. So that was uh, the first time Canadian as a nation fought together in, on a foreign uh, soil. And so during that battle, so a total of 3,598 Canadian soldiers um, lost their lives during the battle. So it was huge for Canada. Because at that time, um, Canada is, was really a young country, only 50 years old. So that's the first time, you know, Canadian feel uh, this battle of Vimy. Um, so they see this battle uh, as Canadian, as a national achievement and sacrifice. So after the battle, so uh, the, the First World War uh, finished, so the government decided they want to build a memorial to remember those uh, lost lives of the soldiers. So, so this um, Walter Seymour Award, so he started to work on this memor memorial in 1921. So we have some of the original drawings he did. So it's quite beautiful when you look at the original uh, drawings. So it took him more than 14 years to actually complete the project. So it was until 1936 the monument was finally unveiled. So, you know, 1936, only three years later, the Second World War broke out. And so luckily, so when the Germans occupied France again, they didn't damage this monument. So it was said that Hitler himself was really quite fond of this monument because it, it is a piece of art. So um, the old paper was um, donated to um, our archives by uh, one of his grandsons. So it contained uh, one meter of textile material uh, plus architectural drawings. And the main focus uh, is on this Vimy Ridge Memorial. So I remember I read some of the correspondence uh, between him and some merchant talking about the stone quality using to build this memorial. So he is really, you know, those type, very stubborn art, um, artist. So he would delay the project until he find the perfect stone. So the, you know, back and forth conversation is really quite entertaining. So because the merchant was so um, kind of frustrated because they couldn't get the right stone, but he insists. So that's why it took him 14 years. So here are some of the photos from this uh, phone. So on the left is, I uh, think, during the installation. Uh, here's one of you know, the final product. And uh, so I mentioned this battle happened um, in 1917. So this year is the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Mem um, the Vimy Ridge. So the queen herself, uh, she didn't attend uh, this um, ceremony, but he sent uh, his son, um, you know, um, I think he, uh, the Duke of, um, the Prince of Wales, and uh, uh, two of uh, her grandchildren, the Duke of Cambridge, so that's um, uh, Prince William and Prince um, uh, Harry, and the, the Canada's Prime Minister and uh, the ex um, the, the France president. So so just last month on uh, April 4th, so they um, they went to the site, and so you can see the memorial here in the background. And so they 
um, they attend this event. And uh, across Canada, so there, they have a different, um, um, a lot of uh, serious uh, celebrations. So in the archives, we did one as well. And I will talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, so Kingston is really a small community, but uh, so there's not a many Chinese population in Kingston. So uh, I searched our collection, I still found a little bit. Um, so one of this is the Lee family home. So the Lee family, um, you know, like many Chinese overseas, they own a restaurant and they were active in the Chinese Canadian community. So the Lee family was the first Chinese family in Kingston to have a child born in Canada. Uh, so I look at some picture and find some interesting fact because actually the Chinese National League branch, so they set up a Kingston branch uh, in 1915. So without the donations of our donors, you will never know this little piece of history. So I think it's quite interesting. And so the Queen's University, we has a large number of photographs. And so there are um, 500,000 prints, negatives. The majority of the collection is focused on Kingston and the Queen's University. But we also have a, a considerable amount of material with national importance as well. And so we have a um, database, and uh, I will just quickly show you. Let me see uh, if I have that open. So we have a searchable database, and so if you search a keyword like the city hall, so you, they have some basic information. And if we have already digitized the photos, so you can see the thumbnails. And all those photos are eligible for purchase. And people can also use uh, them for publication, broadcasting purpose, and there's an extra fee on that, uh, as long as you, you know, give the clearance of, of the copyright. So let's go back to my presentation. Um, so here's um, you know, some photos from Queen's picture collection. So that's women's basketball team from 1910 to 1911, so they call them invincible. Yeah, I think it was quite interesting. And uh, so that's the faculty of medicine from 1914. So clearly they have some fun to take the pictures. So you can see some skeletons they bring to this, to take this <laughs> picture. And uh, so we, so over the years, we have a lot of politicians <coughs> and the royals visit uh, uh, the university. So in 1938, uh, the U.S. president at that time, Roosevelt, visited Kingston. Uh, in 1973, the Queen Elizabeth II herself visited Kingston. And uh, in 1991, as I mentioned, so that's the 150 years of Queen's University. So Prince Charles and the, the princess, oops, let me point. So that's Princess Diana, I think that's uh, the uh, Prince Charles. So they visit um, the uh, Queen's University as well. And uh, so this is one picture from uh, Kingston Picture Collection. So that's 1945. So that's the end of the, I think, the European uh, side of the Second World War. So they are. Uh, celebrating the VE Day stands for the Victory in Europe Day. So um, another significant um, photograph collection is um, from this Chesterfield home. And uh, so this um, person, Chesterfield, was born in England in 1877. Uh, but he lost both his parents at the tender age of 12. So at that time, so People, they just sent him um, to Quebec, Canada, to live with uh, his aunt and uncle. But at 18, so he just left home, and he became an apprentice clerk and a fur trader with the Hudson Bay Company. So he was able, so during the next uh, 10, you know, one, one decade, uh, between eight, uh, 1895 and 1905, so he was able to travel with the Hudson Bay Company to vary some remote areas of Canada. So during that time, 
So he took great interest and in the local, the Inuit and um, Cree people. So we don't know how he learned to, you know, taking photographs. But um, so during that 10 years, so he studied the people there and took a lot of pictures of them. And he also writes um, several articles um, about his observation of the local people uh, with great uh, secrecy. So yeah, that's a, another um, great resources of our photograph collection. So his university will also house um, uh, plans of Queens and local Kingston area buildings dating back from 1840s. So this is our uh, vault with uh, all the uh, architectural plan cabinets. And so one of the uh, large uh, architectural drawing plan collection is this Will William Newland. So uh, Newland um, was born in 1853. So he was an, an architect who designed a lot of uh, uh, buildings in Kingston and areas. So this um, form co consists of nearly uh, 1,200 drawings, blueprints, and the specifications spanning the career of Newland um, from 1882 till his death in 1926. So here um, is uh, one of his drawings of uh, 1892 schoolhouse. So 125 years later, so this schoolhouse uh, it's still standing, but uh, the Queen's School of Business, uh, they renovated the building and did expansions, but uh, they still um, want to preserve the building's heritage. Sorry, I want to point, so that's the old building, so that's the original drawing, so that's the expansion. And um, so, so here's another interesting fact about the Kingston. So, you might know Kingston uh, just you know during my um, talk, as I mentioned, it's the first capital of Canada. So it was nicknamed the limestone cities because a lot of buildings uh, in Kingston was built uh, with limestones. But we are also known as Canada's penitentiary city. That's because at its peak, uh, so there were ten penitentiaries in active operations in the greater Kingston area. So this one is called the Kingston Penitentiary. So the, the local people, we just call it the Kingston Pen or KP. So this prison was um, uh, the former maximum security prison. So it was uh, built you know, by the lake. And uh, so there's a reason because they think Okay, we we'll use this prison by the lake, so it's hard for the prison to, you know, break out. But uh, actually, the the, the the war prisoners actually get out. Uh, so that's an aerial photo. So that's the dome, and that's some of the prisoners' cells. So this um, prison, Kingston Pen, is operated from 1835 um, to 2013. So uh, the collection we have is in a um, microfilm format because the donor um, didn't really lend out the original document, but uh, we were allowed to uh, microfilm them. So the collection contains uh, the minutes book of the board of inspectors, and the, the warden, uh, his journal, and uh, correspondence, and also like a um, uh, financial records of the labor of the convicts. So you can find out how much uh, the convicts got paid for their labor. And also have punishment records, uh, daily reports, and liberation question books, and the duty roster, and the chaplain, uh, chaplain's register, and uh, the convict uh, their, uh, biographic information. And one of the reasons we want to have this form is because Queen's University, we have a really unique relationship with Kingston Penn. So Kingston Penn was a lab and a training school for students of, uh, of Queen's University in law, in psychology, medicine, and education. And in fact, the faculty of education is just across the street from this um, maximum prison. And uh, so 
in the past, the medical students uh, studying psychiatry were introduced to various uh, mentally ill prisoners uh, kept in the basement of the Kingston Penitentiary. So the professor, uh, sometimes they, well held, uh, they held the classes in the penitentiary for the inmates. And some of the inmates, they even get a degree from Queen's University. So while they were serving uh, their time in the Kingston Pen, and uh, I heard some of our alumni was not very, very happy because we are giving degrees for, you know, the the, the convicts. So, so here is a plan. So I think I show you the, the dome. So that's the dome. That's the prison cell. So the next step is inside the prison. So that's just beneath the dome. So in on um, September 30th. 2016, so because this building is just uh, too crowded, so the government decided to close this prison. So that's all the prison employees, the guard, so they took a group photo in the dome. And today, so um, so in 1990, so the Kingston Penitentiary was designated as a national uh, historical site. So, uh, so now uh, it's become a tourist attraction. So next time, if you visit Ontario, visit Kingston, so this might be an interesting place. You'll spend two hours to learn about the history of, of the Kingston Penitentiary. And so we have um, quite a lot of uh, multimedia collections. And um, let's see. Um, so those are housed in a climate-controlled vault. So uh, we have a staff which will monitor the humidity and the temperature of, of this vault um, every working day. And so the sound recordings are mainly um, of the uh, about the Queen's University communications and speaker series on campus. Uh, RC is a, a local student uh, radio and some local history and um, the videos are about campus events and the different activities happened um, uh, on campus. And we do preserve some old technology, you know, to play the old VHS uh, tapes, the wheel-to-wheel -wheel recordings. And uh, so, so that's, uh, they are in our reading room. And uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, still have a large collections uh, on microfilm or microfish. And um, because today the microfilm scanners are much better than you know the old ones. So uh, this is one of our microfilm scanners. So you can uh, read it on, uh, see it on screen, but you, they can also output to a printer. So you can print them out save it to a flash drive as a PDF or JPEG. So it's uh, it's not really inconvenient to use because uh, of the technology. And uh, so over the years, so Queens, um, we built a very good relationship with the city of Kingston, Kingston General Hospital, and the International Hockey Hall of Fame. So if you know hockey, so it's really popular spots in Canada. So we host some of these organizations and um, the city's records in the university archives as well. And each, um, I think, so we did some digitization and web archiving project, as I mentioned. So the first 100 years um, of Queen's Journal now are available online. So we also have digitized photos. So I just show you a screen capture of our database. So some of the photos scanned that you can already see um, some now. Another thing we did is that we start a web archiving project. So because um, the purpose of this project is to preserve the university's website content. Because nowadays, you know, many Queen's publications, um, such as, you know, uh, course calendars, you know, the student newspaper, the Senate committee min minutes, and the general university information, so they only exist on the website. So they are no, we can no longer collect the paper records. 
So, <coughs> as archivists, so we must do something, you know, otherwise those information could be lost. So eventually, uh, in 2016, last year, so we decide to sub subscribe to this um, called Archive It. So it's a service provided by Internet Archives. So we are during a pilot um, project phase. So, so for the first year, we only have, have 500 gigabytes of space. So we focus on capturing the key web pages um, of um, the um, official web page of the administration, faculties, and the services department and the university publication. So we are near the end of this pilot project. Um, so by you know gathering all the uh, information during the pilot project, so now we can draft the policies and procedures for the ongoing use of a web archiving service. And we can also estimate the annual operational cost of this project. So myself and one of my colleagues, we wrote an article about this web archiving project. So if you are a member of the AMAR um, International, so our article uh, will be published in the, um, the next issues, that's the May and the June issue of the Information Management Magazine by Armour uh, International. And each, um, so, um, so I, I think I already show you, so we have uh, this online holding database. So since 1999, so please, we have been using uh, this software called DB Text Works. So we can provide web access to both our phone level and item level descriptions of our holdings. But in recent years, we are moving to a new system called <coughs> Atom. So it stands for uh, access to memory. So it's web-based open source applications. Many uh, Canadian university are using <coughs> this new system. And so each year, starting from 1983, the archives, we will hold an annual uh, lecture. So this lecture, uh, the intention is to highlight uh, the archival collections held by uh, Queen's University Archives. So the lecture uh, has run every fall since uh, the inception in 1983. But uh, in 2004, we did something different. So that year, we actually we rented a city bus. So that's a typical tour bus. So we hosted um, a total of five Kingston social history tours for um, the community members and um, you know students, faculty members uh, in the university. So the five tours and including. The Jewish, the Jewish experience in Kingston, uh, the gay and lesbian history in Kingston, a Chinese community, uh, a black history, and the prisoner's life in Kingston. So uh, each tour uh, was hosted either by a volunteer or students who have wrote their thesis on specific you know, topic. So that's an, it's quite a success because when we did something different. And uh, so we also do a lot of uh, exhibits. So um, we do physical exhibits. Um, so the exhibit is in order to showcase a sampling of um, Queen's Archives, our holdings. So this is uh, in our, um, the first floor or ground floor of uh, our building. So we have uh, the windows, but the more and the more Frequently, we are doing different kind of web exhibits. So some of um, uh, the exhibits we did is about John Buchan. So he's a politician and also an author. Um, I'm not sure if uh, you uh, read his novel, the, I think the, the 39 Steps or something. It was adapted to um, a movie directed by Hitchcock. And we also have Queen's Remembers about uh, World War One and World War Two, because a lot of the Queen's faculty and students they, uh, attended the war, and especially the First World War. And one interesting fact is that um, 
because during the first world war, there's too many faculties and students. They you know they went to the war, so for a short period of time, so Queen's University almost um, went bankrupt because there's no income from uh, you know tuitions. So we have um, a royal visit to, to Kingston and the War of 1812. So those are the web exhibits we did. Um, those exhibits um, also become a, a great archival of sources for teachers um, because teachers can teach students using original source materials, not just Google. <laughs> So one of the most uh, important uh, web exhibits we did is called the Stones Project. So as I mentioned before, so Kingston is uh, also nicknamed as Limestone City. So that's why we decide to use the word stones. So because the stones uh, refers to the, uh, the various cultural communities and the human elements that form the foundation of Kingston. So this web exhibit, we have a total of seven, seven themes. So one of them is about um, the Chinese experience um, in Kingston. So there are three components of this exhibit. Let me open one of the web page. So one of the components is uh, that we have this map. So if you click on each uh, location, so you can read some of the um, you know, uh, description about this particular site. So another component of this exhibit is, is we have, so in 2015, so we have 20 episodes of radio programs, so aired from May to September on CFRC, which is one of the oldest student radio station in Canada. So this radio program featuring interviews with individuals from you know, the, the seven different cultural communities. Uh, so the, for, for example, the Chinese one also featuring uh, not only just English, but uh, Mandarin as well. So it's a collaboration between the archives and the radio station. So some of other projects we work on is uh, the Human History Project. So that's a collaboration between the retirees uh, association and the Queen's Archives. So we hire students to interview uh, the faculty and the staff who worked at the Queen's University in the 1960s. So students uh, will ask them questions about their experience in the Queen's, uh, in Queen's University, uh, the highlights, uh, both the highlights and the low point of, about their experience. And so eventually um, the audio files and the transcript of this, those interviews are made available online as well and also offer our students the opportunity to have the ex this type of experience. And um, another thing we did is that um, we uh, work with the Department of History of Queen's University. So we offer credit for archival work uh, students undertaken in conjunction with Queen's uh, archives. So the student will only get an academic pass and fail credit. So this um, internship could last for either four year or single term. So they can do different types of work, like a digitization, curation, archival research, and description. So, so this young lady, so um, she did um, an exhibit on the vision of Vimy using our uh, Vimy collections, um, the, the old world collection. So I show you about the monument in France. So she, uh, she did this uh, course, um, a single term course, and have this exhibit at the military communication and the electronic museum. So it opens on April 9th. So that's the date of the 100 years anniversary of the Battle of Vimy. And um, now, of course, we have some social media site. So now we have a Twitter 
um, page, and then we also have <coughs> a Facebook page. So, to, so the archivists would we, we just you know tweet about to, do, to highlight our collection. So here is another about uh, this uh, water uh, over fall about the Vimy Memorial. So one of his drawings. So now it's uh, I will talk about Fisk uh, University's rapid management program. So in North America, so the modern rapid management as a professional management discipline really started, I would say, up, um, from the federal government uh, after World War II. And for from very early days, the University of Rapid Management program often have a strong connection with university archives. And many university archives are actually born from the university archives. So that's the case for, uh, for Queen's University, uh, our records management program. So uh, our first records manager was hired in 2006. Um, at that time, so she reported to the university archivists. So uh, the university archives is an academic unit. But in 2015, the records management program uh, was relocated um, to a newly established office called the records management and the privacy office. Uh, but the uh, university archives still remain an important component uh, of the Queen's University's records management uh, program. So I'm the person who uh, it, Working for the archives, but I'm responsible for developing records retention schedule for the whole university. So our retention schedule is based on a functional based records classification system. So here is our three major records group. Then we build the records retention schedules using this classification scheme. And um, so, um, so as a records analyst. So I will interview people from different departments and, and ask about their need, and I draft the, this records retention schedule. The schedule will first go through a departmental level approval. Then the next, it will go to the university uh, records management committee for the final approval. So uh, a lot of people sitting on this committee, including the records manager, the privacy office, officer, the university archivist, uh, the university's uh, legal counsel, so one representing from IT and one from the audit and the risk management department. So that's the com uh, composition of the, this committee. So once this records um, management committee approved the schedule, so the schedule will publish on the uh, website so anyone, literally anyone can have access to that. And we use a Microsoft Access, a, a small database, to maintain our retention schedules and the creative retention schedules. So this is an example of our records retention schedules. So this is about uh, privacy breaches and complaint files. So the retention is that when the privacy officer closed the case file, we retain them for 60 years. Now we have a very detailed disposition plan. So it tells um, the user at the end of the retention, so the files of cases, uh, if they were reported to the Ontario Information and Privacy uh, Commissioner, so maybe that's a more um, uh, serious uh, breach, so those files will be transferred to the archives. But the other uh, records, when they become 10 years old, after the case closed, so they can be destroyed. So that's one example of how our retention schedule looks like. And so, um, because uh, in the retention schedule, we tell people when, uh, how long to keep records, and when to transfer to the archives. So we set up uh, records transfer procedures. So this is, you know, recently we got uh, records transferred from our art center to the archives. And uh, so, uh, like many, um, I, I'm not sure about Hong Kong, but uh, uh, in many Canadian universities, um, each uh, we have a very decentralized budget model. So when it comes to records and um, storage and destruction, so each department or unit, they are very likely to adopt a safe 
a, a self-managed solution. So, but we, uh, Queen's University, we still make an effort to provide some kind of a semi-centralized solution. So in 2014, so Queen's University, we signed a 10-year agreement um, with a commercial service provider called Iron Mountain. So now um, the university we store uh, more than 9,000 boxes of records in Iron Mountain, so this um, third-party storage uh, providers. Um, the, each unit, so they are able to send and retrieve records directly from our mountain um, following, uh, in following a procedure. So we will train our staff on a regular basis. And usually it's a half a year we have a training. So just teach people how to use our mountain services. But when it comes to records of destruction, they must go through the records management and privacy office. Uh, so by this way, the university can obtain some kind of control of destruction of the university records. Now, um, speaking of the managing electronic records, um, so the current situation is not so perfect because the implementation of um, EDRMS, which stands for um, an enterprise, uh, uh, you know, electronic um, records and uh, document records management system. So this solution is still in its infant stage. So many Canadian university, we simply do not have the human and financial resources to run an effective and university-wide electronic records management system. So what we can do is that uh, uh, the records managers, and um, you know, in the past I did that a little bit. So we offer people tips on um, the best practice on managing their shared drives, on you know how to name your uh, electronic files, those types of things. So that's the only thing we can do at this time without uh, an effective tool. So that's unfortunately, but eventually, hopefully, the solution will become cheaper in the future. So now I want to talk about a little bit the access and the privacy legislation in Canada. So we have two levels of legislation. So the first level is the federal legislation. They only govern the federal government institution. Then it's the provincial legislation. So that's where um, each, um, each province of Canada, we have our own provincial legislation. So in uh, the province of uh, Ontario, where I'm living, so we call this Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. So they combine the two into one legislation. So we just call it FIFA. Uh, and in Ontario, the educational institution uh, were bought on the FIFA legislation in 2006. So that was when the Queen's University um, first hired uh, 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 hired our first Rex manager. That was because of this legislation. So if you, in order to show the compliance to this legislation, you have to set up a, a Rex management program. So how the FIPA affect academic archives? Starting from the uh, researcher registration. So here's a photo of our registration card. So we collect a lot of information about our researchers, the names, their uh, the address, the telephone number, email information. So in order to show compliance uh, to this legislation, so on the back of this card, we have this sentence saying, personal information collected from researchers will be held and used in accordance of FIFA. So another uh, effect of this FIFA legislation is retention schedule. So here's an example. So this is our alumni files. And so we decide for alumni files, uh, we, so they will have a 30 year retention. So we're saying, so after death of the individual, 30 years after death of the individual, so their files can be transferred to the archives. So why 30 years? That's because 
in this FIFA legislation, so they have this one sentence saying, the personal information does not include information about the individual who has been dead for more than 30 years. So that's how we come up with this retention of 30 years. And so generally speaking, uh, I would say the FIFA legislation has a positive influence on records management because the basis of the act is the right to access information held by the public bodies. And the right of access uh, depends on you know, the good records management practice. And um, also, also in 2014, so the Ontario the FIFA legislation uh, have an update, uh, an amendment. So now in this act, so they clearly say in this sentence, so they, cry, uh, they require every head of an institution take reasonable measures to preserve records in the custody or under the control of the institution. So after 2014, there's another three universities, they set up their records management program. So now in Ontario, we have a total, total of 20 public funded universities. So now 14 of them has an official records management program. So another six um, universities, because they are too small, usually they have only under 10,000 students. So they just don't have the resources. But I think in the future, because you have to show in your complying with this legislation. So that's why I say it's generally have a positive influence <coughs> on uh, rocks management in Canadian universities. So, um, so finally, I would just want to talk a little bit about you know so how to become an archivist in Canada. So. Um, this one might be too small, but it's a job ad from the University of Toronto. So in March, so they are looking for a new archivist. So I think as any job, usually I think the requirement is education plus experience. So in I think in Canada, in uh, in the U.S. is similar. So oh, sorry. So usually they will require a master in archival studies degree or an, equi an equivalent of um, education and plus experience. So that's how I got my job. Because my, um, I have a master in library and information studies. But because uh, during the summer, uh, I, I got a student job in the archives. So that eventually led me to a career, a career as an archivist and records manager. And another thing is just experience. And uh, so, as a, a, so once you become an academic archivist, so there, um, sorry, so here are actually a list of uh, uh, different universities which uh, provide um, master degrees in archival studies and uh, in like a library and information studies, uh, you know, so that's a list of schools. So some are French, uh, in French language, uh, some are in English language school. So that's some of the universities. And um, so once you become an academic archivist, I think there's this expectation that you have to be active, uh, an active part of the scholarly community. So other than you know achieving your goals and uh, making progress in your daily work, and as archivists, and so we also are required to engage and, and cont contribute to the profession its, uh, itself. So I think many of the archivists in Canada, so they will become the member of the Association of Canadian Archivists. So under this ACA, so there's a university and a college archives special interest in, uh, interest section, so that's where the, um, the academic archives uh, we communicate. And so in the province of Ontario, we have Archives Association of Ontario. And if you are a records and information management professionals, I think a lot of people know about AMA and AIM, so those are uh, two uh, quite big uh, associations for RIM professionals in North America. So that's, that's all for my presentation. 
And uh, so now I think I didn't run over too much time. I still have 20 minutes. And uh, so um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have this microphone, I'm not sure it works very well. <laughs> but uh, if you have questions for Shanjin about her her experience in Canada or questions about archives there. Henry? I, I would like to ask, I mean you mentioned I, I think I, I, I don't okay. Know. Okay. you mentioned earlier that um, the archive, you know, move into the uh, move out from the library mm -hmm. and then move back into the library. Yeah. So what is the main reason? Okay, yeah. Actually, I did some research on this because I think one of the reasons is that so in Canada, so Archives Library, we consider an academic unit. Mm -hmm. So the main, uh, so one of the main thing is that you support teaching and research. So they look at the records management. They think it's a more an administrative functions. So I think back in maybe 2010-ish, <coughs> so the university archives, we did an external review mm -hmm. of the records management program. So at that time, so I think the reviewer decided, so they think the archives is really no longer fit for the records management program for the whole university. Because archives is like a hidden in a secret corner in this one building. People don't know about that. So they have three suggestions. Is one is move to the library. Or another, the second choice is uh, move on the, the IT. And the third is to, uh, we call a secretariat. So the head of the secretariat is the secretary of the uh, university. So it's a senior administrative unit. So, <laughs> so both um, the IT and the library doesn't want to do the records management program. So eventually, it's the secretariat. They decide to take on the records management program. And at the same time, the university uh, decide to finally to have a records management and privacy office set up a new unit. So that seems to be a right fit for the records management program. And I actually, in 2015, so I did a research on records management program in Canadian University. So I interview a total of 26 uh, records managers, archivists, and, and the privacy office. Uh, from 21 Canadian University, but you know, thinking in in Canada, we only have 96 universities, so it's still a good representation. So many people think if records management remain with with academic unit, so but the people in the administrative part they don't really have a close connection with archives. They think archives is just a dumping ground of the records no longer, nobody wants, mm -hmm. <laughs> but actually <laughs> we think they are very important. So, and, but they think if the records management program are with the secretariat, because secretari secretariat are considered a very uh, senior level administration, and the decision made by the secretariat have more influence on the general, you know, admin stuff. So I think that's the main reason. And another reason is because it's a joint um, uh, unit, records management and privacy office. So I just mentioned about the importance of the access. But that's the but reason for moving <coughs> out. Mm -hmm. So, and I heard, heard earlier that you actually moved back into the library, right? Oh, at that time, it's just the library just doesn't have, uh, didn't have the space. <laughs> the archives collection is growing and growing. And uh, so they say, okay, you should become a, a, you know, a separate unit. So that in the 1980s, it was quite different at that time, I think. So, so for what 30 is the relationship years. now between the three offices, you know, library, your op okay. uh, yeah, and also the record and yeah. Okay. Is yeah. there a hierarchy? Okay. So, so the library is an um, academic 
unit. So it reports to the VP academic. It used to, oh, uh, I think the provost. The provost, yeah. <laughs> they changed name over years. Mm -hmm. And the archives become a branch of the library. So the university archivists report to the university librarian and the university librarian uh, report to the provost. Then the secretary is a different um, administrative unit because in, um, in Can uh, Canadian University, so we often have this dual governance. So you have the academic side of the university so that's the VP academic dealing with academic issues and you have the admin of the university. So that's to the dual governance. So librarians and archivists are faculty yes. at your school. Yeah. Okay. But I noticed when, because I'm interested in this too, but I noticed when you talk about records management that the records management committee, the university archivist sits on that. Yes. Right? And all of the records classification and retention schedules are written by the archives. Yes. So, yeah. so they are still quite heavily involved, but it's more of a relationship between the secretariat, which yeah. we would call the registry, right? It's the same type of office. Because we, I don't report to the records manager. I still report to, to the university archives. The university archives, yeah. even though... Yeah, I will. Right, okay. Yeah. So. It's, I have... Um, I know you've seen this too in, in your, your, the changing mm -hmm. types of reporting structures and yeah. organizational things. Um, in some universities where I've worked, the archives has been an independent unit reporting directly to the provost. In some universities where I've worked, the archives has been an independent unit reporting to the um, vice president for technology. Um, and in some universities I've worked in, the archives has been uh, a part of the library combined with special collections. Um, there's sort of two units rolled into mm -hmm. one. Um, uh, but with the records management being controlled by the state government. So the function of the, the records manager, for instance, at William & Mary, as state records officer, I had to report to the government in Richmond, completely independent of the university, because I had held statutory responsibility for the records of all the campuses. But the archives was a part of the Special Collections Research Center and a department under the library. So it just, I think, it depends a lot on mm -hmm. the background history of the university and what makes the most sense enterprise-wide for the records management system because, um, as Shanjin has pointed out, um, especially as we, as we move towards a solution for electronic records management, uh, creating an enterprise-wide system is quite difficult within universities because unlike corporations, universities tend to have very independent thinking units and, and faculties and, and units who kind of would like to go their own road, make their own decisions. So it can be a bit like herding cats. Um, one thing I noticed too that's different about Queen's University and Hong Kong U's archives, um, and again this varies from school to school, um, you collect local history records. Yeah. You collect archives of um, other institutions, mm -hmm. businesses, and organizations. Yeah. Whereas the archives here is a classic archive in the sense that we are only the memory of Hong Kong U and the Hong Kong U family. It is a, a, a classic archive in the sense that this is an institutional archive. Special collections in the library mm -hmm. is a collecting, what we would call a collecting Mm -hmm. uh, a library or a collecting archive in that they will take in records that have to do with Hong Kong history and local history and mm -hmm. we don't we yeah. don't do the same thing but many universities that I've worked in before do collect outside of the university's mm -hmm. history and do uh, collect local history um, because archival collections tend to go to the university archives Whereas special collections mm -hmm. only collect rare books and manuscripts. That's it. Yeah, I just want to add because Kingston is such a small community, and Queen's Archives, 
probably is the only place which have the resources to take care of all those uh, historical records. So that's why we take the city of Kingston, the general, uh, Kingston General Hospital, and also this international. Because you actually keep the government records. Uh, from a certain period. Yeah, yes. So, like uh, the um, collect their land registry books are from the early days till 1970s of local history. So, there's a lot of people coming in to do research on the house they, they are going to purchase. So, that's because we, yeah, we are really small community. So, there's it's just Queen's Archives can do this type of things. And Are you the only big institutional archive in the whole, in the in, whole city? In that area, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's why. So, and, and I also want to add something about it because, you know, Canada, we have the Quebec, which is friend, mainly French-speaking um, province in Canada. So they do things a little bit different. So one major thing is about uh, um, the approval of their university records retention schedule. They actually have to go through the provincial government, so they have a ministry really? oh. to, to do that. So that's totally different from any part of Canada. But because they're French Canadians, <laughs> that's so special, they have a long history of archival tradition, which is quite different from the English-speaking areas of Canada. And uh, I will say they will have better records management after my research because they, they just pay, um, they're really, really, you know, noticed importance of records management. And because their retention schedule is approved by the provincial government, it actually carry more weight because it becomes law. So once it becomes law, you have to follow the records retention schedule. Other, you know, but in the other university, like our university, is only for our own university. And some, uh, some departments, <laughs> they just ignore you. Anyway, so that's something I want to add. And uh, any other questions? Yeah, feel free to ask me anything if I can answer. Yes, please. Oh, it really depends because it, so sometimes it could be maybe a few months and it could be years. It depends on each individual department because some departments, they are very collaborative, you know, so they will work with you because re I, I think the last three months I have a great experience. So I work for the universities. Um, we call advancement, but I think in uh, HKU you call debate development. So they actually they assign a contact person with me. So that person um, will arrange all the meetings with different uh, different individuals from the department. And that person will actually sit with me because uh, because their department, they really want to do something about, you know, uh, the, their records keeping practice. So that, that's a great experience. But some of the uh, department, uh, if they, uh, they don't think it's <laughs> important, they just ignore you. So usually I will send them an email, I'll wait two weeks, there's no response, and I'll send another follow-up, you know, just push them. And so it really depends. So could take years, so that's, that's, that's not uncommon, I would say. And the other thing, too, to keep in mind is if we <clears throat> for instance, we're almost completely finished with the enterprise-wide retention schedules for um, administrative records at Hong Kong U. It has eight or nine sections, and um, it's uh, it applies to those records that are common to all departments. It takes quite a long time to classify and to write those. But then on top of that, you have to go into each individual department and look at their records that are unique to that department, the program records, the programmatic records that make, that, that are the purpose of that unit. And those have to be tailor-made. Those have to be written for each mm -hmm. function of the university or department or faculty. And it's ongoing. It's not written in stone. You don't just write the retention schedules and you're good to go for 20 or 30 years. Because the university, like a business, changes 
names of departments, they merge functions, they're changing all the time, and so you, the, the schedules have to be reviewed and altered too, you know, over time. Yeah, so I agree with that because sometimes the legislation also changed. Um, I think in, back in 2008, so we have uh, this research ethic board. So they have a um, health and um, science related research ethics files. So, but so they used to have only have a 10 year retention, but now the legislation require you know people keep the records longer uh, for 25 years. So we have to change that to reflect to you know meet the new requirement of legislation. So yeah, it's fine. It's, you're just going through the same process again. And uh, so some, sometimes I think when you work with people, you it's all, I, I actually like to interview with people, meeting with them, because it's an opportunity you can, I would say you can educate them on the good practice of uh, records management. And uh, also because I'm wearing the hat of an archivist, so when I meet with people on campus, so I will say, okay, do you have any this, like that? So they might have historical value, so contact our archive, uh, contact our archivist, you know, transfer your uh, records to the archives for, for permanent retention. So um, I, I, th I think I strongly believe you, you want to have established some kind of a personal, um, personal, you know, connections with uh, the, the people. And then now, I think years later, they will know your name. When they think about, you know, dispose their records, they will think about you. So. Are you allowed to dispose of records at Queen's without making a record of the disposal or without getting the approval of the archives or the records management office? Oh, Is there a system for that? Yes, yeah, so I think, so first we really differentiate university records and the non-university records. So, and we have, I think the records management office, they have a fact sheet telling people what are considered the official copy of the university records because if you are getting rid of duplicates, you know, or um, some transitory records, so something like in the draft format, which are not considered university records, you don't have to go through the formal destruction procedure because we do require units to file an uh, official records destruction form, mm -hmm. which will send a copy to the records management office. So by this, the, the university can have some control over the records destruction. And um, uh, I think people are starting to do that. And another thing I want to mention, I don't know about HKU, because for, um, for like uh, the faculty, so if they do their own research and their teaching materials, they, those are belong to the faculty themselves. They are not considered university records. So those are not, yeah. It's quite similar here. Yeah. Research and teaching materials mm -hmm. created by faculty members or students belong to that mm -hmm. faculty member or student. Yeah. They are not considered university records in the same sense that the administrative records of that faculty would be considered yeah. university records. And, uh, yeah. But do we collect and, uh, those private records to archives, like I mentioned. Uh, we do too sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> the Nobel winner, the, you know, the Professor McDonald's, and, you know, his records. Which we consider uh, private records, not university yeah. records. Yeah. So, any questions? Uh, yes. You know, under the uh, reign of Queen Victoria, there are quite a number of uh, colleges and universities named as Queen's uh -huh. yeah, College yeah, yeah, or University or Victoria. Yeah. Wonder if there's a tradition of uh, exchange of uh, school. Uh, materials or information among these sort of British uh, universities all over the world, and if there's such kind of a tradition heritage, uh -huh. uh, are you also treating this as your part of your archives? Um, I I think there must be a lot of you know uh, partnership between you know, different universities because the Queen's University actually. One of the donors, uh, they bought us a castle 
in England. So, so there's a student, there's a, I can't remember which faculty, so they have a program. So student was spend one year in that castle in England to study for one year. So they, they, there must be something, you know, in the class. <laughs> I like somebody to buy us a castle. Yeah. <laughs> and they have a peacock. They have a great um, garden with pe uh, peacock. So that's what I heard. I haven't oh. visited there before. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's a question. Yes? Could, could you speak more about the tax incentives you mentioned? And are there any, any not maybe tax incentives, but any ways in Hong Kong where individuals are incentivized? Yeah. So, I think that might be something different from, you know, <coughs> here. Different, yeah, because yeah. I think, it, uh, yes, let me bring up uh, the page, one page about our donation, because I don't want to speak something if it's not correct. <coughs> Um, so it mentioned, so actually, so Queen's University, so we are this class A repository. So actually, so the university, the head of the archives, the university archivist, so he is able to uh, place some of the archival material mm -hmm. under the value of 2,000 Canadian dollars. Mm -hmm. So. That, but it's not the archives we issue a tax receipt because the university we have this advancement department. So they are dealing with gift. So we sign a deed of gift like uh, you guys. And so with this deed of gift and the evaluation documentation, so then it will be processed, the tax receipt will be processed by the, um, uh, the, the department of advancement. So, so I think, so I mentioned that um, that's one of the incentive. A lot of people, they like to donate archival material to the university. But we also have outside appraisers, because it's, uh, if it's above certain, like uh, above $2,000, so they have to be dealt with external appraisers. Um. In America, the law is different, and the Society of American Archivists Code of Ethics precludes us from appraising anything that comes into our own collections because that is seen as a conflict of interest under the law. Okay? I have carried that practice into Hong Kong, and as I later found out, as I got to learn more about the laws here, you know, as we were working on records management issues, um, that in fact, from a risk management point of view, we're better off doing that in Hong Kong. We do not appraise collections that come into the university archives. We consider that unethical because then we would be the owners. However, under Hong Kong tax law, you can um, claim uh, donations to public education facilities as charitable contrib contributions. But I always tell every donor, first of all, you need to have an outside appraiser if it's I tell them usually, if it's over 5,000 Hong Kong dollars, get an outside appraiser to help you with this. And secondly, clear it with your tax person. Because the, under the IRD's laws, um, there's some difference between private schools and publicly funded, like UGC universities, and, so, and you need to be sure that you're doing the right thing on your own taxes. The university archives cannot be responsible for those decisions for people. So I, I tell people to check with their own attorney or tax preparer or, or financial advisor about that. Um, when we have a gift that's worth more than 5,000 Hong Kong dollars, we notify the development office here of that gift and fill out a form for them. Other than that, we handle our deeds of gift and our donations under the University Archives Administration. We handle our own stuff. In fact, we have had 
very few large financial donations, so it's not something that we have to do all the time. And because we do not appraise, usually gifts in kind, like gifts of collections, we've had to report very few of those. There are a few exceptions where the gift itself has an intrinsic monetary value. For instance, the sterling silver model of the main building that was a gift to Governor Lugard in 1916. That has to be appraised by um, the, uh, the insurance people for the university. So every year we, you know, we have a statement that says, you know, we have these things. Yeah. But it's, yeah, so. It depends on the laws of the jurisdiction you're in, how you handle your, your donation process. One thing we do insist on, as mm -hmm. you do, is, um, de is deeds of gift. If it's not a university record that's being given to us through a transfer process with a transfer form where the unit head and the university archivist sign off, on it, then we have a deed of gift. So, for instance, a faculty person's papers, their own research, if they donate that, that must have a deed of gift. And in that deed of gift, they turn over physical rights, copyright, and intellectual property right to those papers, to the university. Not to the archives, to the university. The archives is only the re repository. Does anybody else have a last question for Shanjin? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'm not too sure whether I should ask this a very difficult question. Okay. <laughs> well, my motto is, well, just like George Orwell said in 1984, who controls the past controls the future. Uh -huh. Who controls the present controls the past. <laughs> so being an archivist <laughs> or any <laughs> colleagues, it is a very difficult question to mm -hmm. control, you see, to collect things. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, you spoke about the, the law, which is the minimum standard. Mm -hmm. But being somebody, a, a person, a human, mm -hmm. to, to do working with some mm -hmm. historical records. Mm -hmm. So it's not matter with just following the laws, and there are certain ethical and moral mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. And of course, there are privacy and other mm -hmm. issues. So are there any ethical or other standards that um, being archived I, I think it, um, our archivists archivist really fought hard to get the records. I think it comes to like a writing retention schedules, because recently is still about um, the um, ethic board, the, the research ethic board, because we want their board and um, the board minutes, and uh, so we are telling them, you know, now we extend the retention to 25 years, and after 25 years, please transfer the records to the archives. But the committee, they really have some concern, because one of the reasons they mentioned is saying, so if there's uh, any kind of a health study applications, so if the Queen's um, ethic, research ethic board approve it, but for some reason, and if there's a similar study in other in another university, but the other university's uh, research ethic board didn't approve it, so they don't kind of want the records to get out to be uh, to uh, you know to be uh, accepts uh, accessible after um, you know the, the even after 25 years. So I'm we're showing the the, the legislation saying okay, after 20 years, what's 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 your concern? But anyway, so our archivists really insist on taking those records. So actually, June the 22nd, so the Research Ethic Board at Queen's Z will have a retreat. So they actually, for the last few days, they sent me an email asking us, the archives, to come to their retreat, the, the meeting, to talk about why we want to this record. So at least they give us a chance to explain why we want those records. So they will consider this information. But the thing is, in the university, is that uh, Unless there's a legal requirement, I think it's to each um, individual department, they can make decisions so what they want to transfer to the archives, what they do not. But as archivists, we want to keep, um, you know, 
the collective memory of the university. We we don't want people to hide their records. So I, I think the, the the environment in Canada may be a little bit different. I think people are more open, so they are fine. You know, after certain years, they are not really afraid of open the information to the public because. The public really have, to, we think, have the rights to know certain things, and, um, and so there, there are difficulties, there are pushbacks about transferring records to the archives. But uh, as archivists, we fight for that, and uh, but but sometimes we we cannot always get the way we want. But <laughs> uh, yeah, but we will try our best. Actually, in Hong Kong, we are having a film, The Vanished Archive. Probably you are Yeah, I heard a little bit from, yeah. you know, Stacy so yesterday. So we are quite different. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think that's why I want to, you know, visit HKU and maybe in the future other uh, Hong Kong universities. And uh, maybe I can write something about that. <laughs> the, the, the good thing is, is that, um, and I think Hong Kong U Archives has had a hand in, in promoting this, um, uh, more education about archives, more education about being an archivist, more, um, more attention to being open, transparent, and accountable about our records, um, not just at the university level. You know, I remember when I came, there were only two universities in, in Hong Kong that had archives, HKUST and us. And, um, and uh, we now have six. I think six or seven of the universities have um, have or are building archives, and um, and our four of the five, four or five of them now have chosen to use the same open source software that we're building our database. Anna here is building our archives finding aids into open source software. So eventually, our dream is to have a single platform from which you can access archival collections in all of the universities that share that archive space software so that you can do scholars and students and the public can do searches on that same platform. And, um, and this push towards openness and, and accountability and transparency has resulted in um, now the Law Reform Commission, um, you know, three or four years ago established the subcommittees for archives law and freedom of information law here in Hong Kong. So I expect probably sometime within this now Carrie Lam administration you're going to see laws passed for Hong Kong in terms of having um, some legal, some structural support for this kind of work. So, um, and I suspect that that will in turn influence all of the publicly funded, especially the statutorily funded, you know, or founded universities like Hong Kong U, which were, you know, built according to an ordinance. So, um, as well as some of the big sort of semi public organizations like the Hospital Authority and the Aviation Authority and people like that. You're, you will see some trickle downward, I think, from this kind of thing. And it's a good thing because the more people are aware and the more uh, we have sort of a uh, public interest, then the easier it is to, you know, do our jobs. So, yeah. Eternally optimistic, that's us. <laughs> so. Anyway, thank you all very much yeah, for thank coming. You. Yeah, okay. appreciate you taking time. Thanks, Sanjay. Great job. Yay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to send you copies of all these photos. Thanks, Marina.